Committee, Council Members, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I first uh, looked at this issue a couple of months ago, and I just, uh, I really am passionate about it, and I, I want you to know a little bit about my background without talking too much about myself, but I have two degrees in geology, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. I spent a semester working uh, at uh, the University of New Mexico uh, on, toward a doctorate, decided that uh, I really didn't want to be poor for that long, so I got a job offer with Mobile Oil as a senior geologist, and I uh, basically spent 15 years in the oil and gas business. I was good at finding oil and gas. They kept promoting me, became an exploration manager, worked for Consolidated Natural Gas, worked for Tenneco and Mobile. And um, exploration geology was, was my thing. And um, I, along the way, I was elected as mayor of Fairview, Texas. I served three terms as mayor. It's a suburb of Dallas. So, um, and then I, I wrote a book, and uh, I basically, when that book was well received, I decided that I liked being a writer better than a corporate vice president, so I got out of the business. And <clears throat> anyway, I was asked by a friend to take a look at this, uh, at this issue, and I immediately started looking at some of the old cross sections that I'd seen in, when I was at the University of New Mexico, and I spent a lot of time studying the geology of New Mexico during that one semester. And my whole point about this is that this really is not an oil and gas issue. This is a drinking water issue. And I want to go through with you a presentation that I made that I basically started by presenting to the commissioners of Sandoval County individually so that they would understand what this issue was all about because I felt that the oil and gas companies weren't exactly telling them the truth. So let's, let's take a look at what I showed them here. Uh, New Mexico uh, has a history of oil and gas production. Most of the production is in the upper left in the San Juan Basin and in the southeast in the Permian Basin or the Delaware Basin. This gray area right through here, which is called a frontier area, is the Rio Grande Rift. It's called a frontier area in exploration geology terms because there is no production in there now. And there's good reason for that, and I'll talk to you more about that. On the November the 16th meeting, the president of the Rio Grande Foundation said that the oil and gas industries are nothing new to Sandoval County. Well, that's true, but let me show you uh, there's a difference between drilling in the San Juan Basin and drilling in um, the Albuquerque Basin. This is a geologic map. All of the colors here are rocks that outcrop at the surface where we are standing, okay? And you can see up in the San Juan Basin to the northwest, there are not very many colors up there. That's because there are not very many rocks outcropping. It's fairly flat. And that's where most of the production is. In the Albuquerque Basin, and you can see the outline of Sandoval County here, uh, you can see it's a completely different geologic province. Lots of faults, which are those black lines, uh, fractured up to beat the band, okay? If you do a cross-section, generalized cross-section, through the San Juan Basin, this is what you see. A general bowl-shaped basin, lots of oil and gas production. The uh, energy companies that want to come in and drill in Sandoval County right now want to drill the Mancus Shale, the organic-rich Mancus Shale. They want to they drill horizontally, and they want to do hydraulic fracking in it. And it's already being done up in, San in this part of uh, the basin, but you can see that the water aquifer is way up above this Mancus Shale, and so there's not much of a risk for contaminating the water over here. But this is a cross-section of the Albuquerque Basin and the Rio Grande Rift. Here's Placidus and Bernalillo and Rio Rancho. I'll show you this cross-section a little bit later, but for now I want you to concentrate on the difference between those two basins. Okay? The oil and gas industries are nothing new to Sandoval County. Well, that's right. Unconventional drilling, horizontal drilling and fracking in a heavily faulted basin is definitely new to Sandoval County, okay? The process of fracking has been around since the 1940s and has been done safely in New Mexico for decades. Again, this was a statement by uh, the Rio Grande Foundation president on November the 16th. Well, I want to talk about that a minute. Technically, he's correct. What he's talking about, fracking that's been around since the 1940s, is vertical fracking. 
vertical fracking has been done for years where they drill down in through the aquifer, they case things off, they drill down into the formation that they want to produce oil and gas, mainly gas from, and it's, it's a tight impermeable thing so they, they lower a kind of a fracking gun down there and they shoot bullets into it and that's the fracking process. That's vertical fracking, that's been around since the 40s. What's new is unconventional drilling, which is horizontal drilling, and drilling straight into the shales, and then hydraulically fracking them. This, this is new. This is relatively new. This is not the type of fracking that this guy's talking about that goes back to the 40s. This has uh, really been perfected because of new technology here in the last 15 to 20 years, and even less than that. So let, let's be clear about the difference. If you look at uh, where production is and horizontal fracking has been done in New Mexico, it's up in the San Juan Basin and it's down in the Delaware Basin. And again, it's done in a basin that looks like this because the Delaware Basin looks just like the San Juan Basin. And here are all of the uh, wells, including plugged wells in New Mexico. And my fear is that they're going to try to do something like this in the center in the Albuquerque Basin because if they do that, we're going to have real problems and I'll show you why. The process of fracking has been around since the 40s. My response is not this kind of fracking. There's a difference between vertical fracking, which has been going on since the 40s, and hydraulic fracking associated with horizontal drilling, also known as unconventional drilling, which is relatively new. Okay, let's talk about this, uh, this drilling uh, for a minute. Um, we know that when, when uh, they come down and, and drill into, into the shales, uh, and they go in and they frack it, very hard with, with uh, hydraulic fracking. They produce oil and or gas, and I'll tell you more about that. But this is the Manca shale that they're going for. It's part of the new unconventional shale play that's going on across the United States. And you've probably heard about that. I'll talk to you more about that in a minute. But uh, on Thrust Energy's website, they say, our focus is upon new unconventional liquids-rich shale plays. So there's no doubt that they're drilling these shales because they're low risk for finding oil and gas. Very high probability. All right, in, when, they, when they turn the drill bit, let me go back in here a minute. When they tr turn the drill bit into the shale formation, sometimes they go up to a mile or more in the formation. Whereas in a conventional drilling, they just popped into this formation and that's all they can produce. They can produce much more by going this way and they set off charges. And let's talk about this fracking process a little bit. There's three basic stages. One is blasting fissures, and a wire equipped with explosive charges, and let me underline that word explosive, charges perforates the well casing, and this creates small fissures and cracks in the shale. The shale contains natural gas, but the fissures are too small for ample amounts of gas to travel through. So this is where the hydraulic fracturing comes in. They put, they put together a high-pressure mixture of sand, chemicals, and water that expands the fractures and they send it down the well bore and they pump it in under very, very high pressure and it makes these fractures really large. And then what happens is that they extract the gas, expansion increases the flow of natural gas, the water mixture is pumped back out of the well and gas follow, flows up the pipeline into the wellhead. It's not just the gas that flows back up to the wellhead, it's the water and all the chemicals associated with it. And they have to do something with that. So what do they do? Now here's a kind of a diagram that kind of shows where the water comes into play here. First of all, they've got to acquire the water. And they've got to get lots of, a, lots, a lot of water to use this. Then they've got to mix chemicals into it. And right now, the United States government does not require, at a federal level, the oil and gas companies to tell us what the mix, what's in those mixtures or what those chemicals are. But we all know that they're dangerous. Um, okay, then they mix all of the chemicals into the water and then they inject it into the well. This is the fracturing process, okay? Hydraulic fracturing. Then they get the flow back and the produced water and then they have to deal with that wastewater that comes up, okay? And one of the things that they, normally the way they, they deal with it is they, they re-inject it into the subsurface into formations that can take the water easily. And it's this process, this injection process, that contributes to the earthquakes associated with fracking. Now, this is what's uh, contributing to many of the earthquakes in Oklahoma, as you're aware of. And 
Um, what the oil and gas companies continually say is that fracking doesn't cause these earthquakes. Technically, that's true. But if you look at the whole process of fracking, it's certainly not true, okay? Let's talk about an aqu aquifers now. Um, an aquifer is an underground layer of water-bearing permeable rock, fractured rocks or unconsolidated materials from which groundwater can be extracted uh, using a water well. Here's a, just a generalized uh, schematic of what, a, what an aquifer looks like. And you can see I kind of put something here that shows a eastern margin and a western margin. This is from the US Geological Survey. And this map uh, is the uh, map of the uh, Rio Grande Rift drinking water aquifer. And I've outlined in circle here Sandoval County. Sandoval County is, most of the color there is designed as, listed as an open basin that can contribute surface water to the Rio Grande. What this shows is this is one continuous drinking water aquifer, okay? Um, and by the way, most, or all of the maps that I'm going to show here uh, have come from uh, U.S. Geological Survey or New Mexico Bureau of Geology maps. Uh, this is all standard science, okay? It's been established for years. What does the aquifer look like? Here's a picture of the actual aquifer in, um, in the Albuquerque area and Sandoval County. And basically, you see uh, the aquifer we're talking about is comprised of gravel, sand, fractured sandstone, and fractured rocks. Fracture, keep that word in the back of your mind. Uh, and then the water goes through the interstitial pores of, of these various rocks, and you can, you can tell that as you, as you move left on that, it gets non-porous and then really can't support an aquifer unless it has fractures in it. Okay. The Rio Grande Valley drinking water aquifer. This is a cross-section in the subsurface, and I want to show you that the, the Sandia Mountains are, are over here. I've list, uh, we've got the Manca Shale here, as you can see. Manca Shale, Manca Shale. And uh, you probably can't read it from there, but it's this base of the tertiary aquifer, okay? That aquifer schematic would go like this in the Albuquerque Basin, okay? And notice also that it's very fractured. The aquifer, as well as the bank of shale, very fractured. This ordinance does not apply to the Pueblos. The legal counsel to thrust energy said that. Well, let's take a look at this aquifer, see if it does apply to the Pueblos or not, you know? And the fact is that this is kind of an outline of the aquifer. I showed you a little bit more detailed map. This is an actual contour map of the water level of the Albuquerque aquifer. And you can see the geology shows that this is a continuous aquifer, especially in the center of the basin. So what's my response to that? Well, the main Rio Grande aquifer is continuous. It does not stop at the various Pueblo Nation surface borders. It flows continuously in the subsurface. Water flows downhill, and so will the harmful chemicals with which it may be contaminated. Okay? And I'm going to go back one more time and point out that you start up, you're higher up there, you're going downhill as you go south, but it's not just the water going to the south, the water flows in from the sides as well, okay? There are many different flow rates and paths to take. The aquifer is discontinuous, separated by several faults. There is very little possibility of contamination. Now this was said at that meeting by the professional consultant to thrust energy, who was a civil engineer not a geologist. Well, my, my response to that is, well, he's right when you come up near Placidas on the eastern margin or you, or you go over toward the western margin near San Ysidro, there are fractures that break up the water reservoirs. And so uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that I showed this to one of the commissioners and, and they said, he said that there was, well, that's just a line on a map, that's just a, you can drill in between those faults. And, and I said, well, wait a minute. You know, it's, they're not just lines on a map. They are fault zones with thousands of fractures. Um, and here's an example of what a major fault zone looks like. And you can see where it goes. And also, you, you know, when you, uh, when you have tremendously high pressure down there, fluids that are released, they're going to look for some way out. And they're going to go up if they can. And they go up these fractures. And here's an outcrop 
of a major fault zone. And I want to point out not only the fault zone, but look at all of these smaller fractures here. These are joints. They're faults that are not offset, but they too contribute. And, and hydrocarbons and water can go up through these things, and they do. Uh, here's a, a kind of a three-dimensional view of a very heavily fractured formation. And here's the top of the bedding. Look at all the fractures in there. I mean, I would venture to say that every formation in the Albuquerque Basin looks just like that or pretty close to it in the subsurface. Okay, so fractures. You drill down, you drill straight down, you do a horizontal drilling, and this is the difference between the San Juan Basin and the Albuquerque Basin is there's so many fractures, if you hit one of these fractures, it could clearly contaminate the aquifer. The aquifer is discontinuous, uh, and my answer to this is a separation of aquifers by faults occurs only at shallow depths closer to the eastern mar mountains in Placidus and the western margins like San Ysidro. The risk of contamination is very, very high. Now, I look at the uh, Sandia Mountains, and, and I, see, I see the whole basin, and I was trying to figure out some way to... to to kind of explain to somebody who's not a tectonic or a structural geologist, but I took, you know, th I took this picture, I didn't take it, but it, was, it came out of the, uh, one of the geology journals, but here's a picture, from, it's basically from Bernalillo, the Rio Grande River and the Sandia Mountains. You see those horizontal layers up there, in the upper left? Those are Paleozoic rocks. Those rocks are older than the Manca Shale, and those rocks are in the subsurface where we stand right now, and if you go down, straight down from the river, you're looking at anywhere between two and four miles, you're going to find those same rocks. And what that means is if you're driving 60 miles an hour, it'll take you four minutes driving straight down to hit those rocks. That's how fractured this basin is. And, and here's a schematic of it that shows the sandy amounts here. And look at the, look at the fractures here. And you, these, these same rocks are way up there. And I mean, that's a pretty large amount of displacement. And the reason I point that out is because there's got to be lots of faults, right? Okay, so what do we look like in the subsurface? Here's a, here's a map that came from uh, the New Mexico Survey, the geological group, and uh, it shows where where we are, and, and I, I looked at this particular uh, map in red. This is the area, this is a uh, structural map. It shows faults, it shows fault blocks, and of course it shows the river. But I wanted to make, you know, show you that Placidus, Bernalillo, Rio Rancho, and Albuquerque. And let's take a closer look up north here. Um, again, you can see Placidus, Bernalillo, and Rio Rancho. I want to show you two cross sections. A, A prime that goes right through Bernalillo and Placidus, and B, B prime. Now, what we're doing here is we're going to, this is a surface map, we're going to tilt it up, and I'm going to show you cross sections of what the subsurface looks like. A, A prime is here. As soon as I saw this, as an old exploration geologist, I saw this anticline, which is called the Ziana anticline or Ziana thrust block, which is probably a better term because it's, a thrust, it's thrusted up. But look, th the reason that I, I point that out is because as soon as I saw that, I said, well, that's what thrust energy is going to drill. They're going to drill that anticline because that's what oil and gas companies do to cut their risk because oil migrates up. So, uh, but also look at, look at the, the offsets of the Mancus Shale throughout here, and you can see it's bowed up a little bit here. This is where most of their acreage is. I'm going to take this cross-section and I'm going to break it into two on east and west. Look at, look at the east side. The east side, you see the Sandia Mountains and you see the, the fractures coming down. And I've circled in white here the Manca Shale, where the Manca Shale is in contact with or perilously close to the drinking water aquifers. And let I me mean, look at it. I mean, you can see it's almost at the surface up in Placidus. Uh, and you can see right here, it's directly in contact with the drinking water aquifer. Over here, it's very close to the aquifer. Even though it's not in contact, what's right between them? A major fault. All right, let's look at the west side. Here's the, here's the thrust block. Look at where the faults are. Same thing. I mean, it's so easy to pick an area that's risky. 
to, to, to do any kind of horizontal fracking in. All right, let's go look at, uh, and remember that one right through Placidus and Bernalillo. Let's look at this cross-section, BB prime, which is south of Rio Rancho. Same thing, you know. You, you have tremendous amount of faults. You have the Mancus in contact with, with the reservoir, the aquifer, and it's easy to spot these things. I could have circled, I could have put a lot more circles on here if I had to, but I want to make, sh make one point, and that is, I'm going to compare the AA prime and BB prime, and I want you to remember that Rio Rancho is like right in the middle between the two. So I've kind of aligned them the way they should go, and here you, you can see AA prime cross section, you can see the uh, the anticline or the thrust block. Down here, where is where is that thrust block? Where's that anticline? You can't see it, is it? It's gone. It's gone, and it's in a very short distance. What are you going to find in, in the Rio Rancho area? Who knows? I know what you're going to find for sure, is you're going to find a lot of faults and fractures. Whether or not you're going to see an anticline or not, I don't know. That, and the point of this whole thing is, as an exploration geologist, and I'm drilling wells where I'm looking for a specific target, it's really unpredictable because it's so fractured. There has not been a single documented instance of water encroachment by oil and gas wells in Sandoval County. Chairman of Thrust Energy said that. I said, well, yeah, no, there hasn't. That's because nobody has drilled a well in the Mancus Shale and hydraulically fracked it that was right into contact with a main drinking water aquifer. That's why. And that is an example of Bernalillo under Bernalillo and under Rio Rancho, same type of thing. Okay, what you're really looking at is, is uh, areas that are heavily fractured. They haven't been drilled in, in New Mexico like this, not hydraulic fracking. The only drilling has been here in basins like the San Juan Basin. Not been a single documented uh, instance of water encroachment. That's because there's been no unconventional drilling uh, in high-risk areas of Sandoval County like the Albuquerque Basin. This is a map of the United States that shows all of the major organic-rich shale plays that are going on right now. Uh, it started in Pennsylvania. It's, I'll show you some things about that. It's going on in Texas, and you may have heard of the Bakken Formation up in North Dakota. Uh, and now they're using the same pitch. The oil and gas companies, the same pitch. They're coming down here, and they're saying the same thing they set up there to drill uh, right here in in the Albuquerque Basin, but we're not going to buy it. Look at the Wind River Basin. What's happened in the Wind River Basin of Wyoming? These people, their entire water, drinking water aquifer was contaminated because of hydraulic fracking and um, horizontal drilling. And what happened to them was uh, they, uh, uh, there was a study done by a Stanford University professor who couldn't get the study published at the EPA, so he quit and he went to Stanford and he did the study and he proved that the fracking chemicals were in the drinking water aquifers here. Um, and the unsafe practices that were going on, surface dumping, unlined pits, shallow fracking, they found carcinogens, methane, hydrocarbons, fracking chemicals in the drinking water aquifer and now the whole town has to use bottled water. And it's paid for by the oil and gas company that did this. And what happens when they go bankrupt? Who pays for it then? Okay, I also learned that it is perfectly legal to inject stimulation fluids into underground drinking water aquifers. That was put in by the Bush administration. And governments, state governments are trying to change that right now all across the country. They're really fighting that. Another thing is if you look at the Wind River Basin up here, um, here's a cross section that goes northeast, southwest. That's a cross section. What does that look like? See any faults in there? Does that look more like the San Juan Basin, where there's no problem with the drinking water aquifers, or the Albuquerque Basin? It's a rhetorical question. Here's Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, um, uh, basically the circled areas there are areas where the drinking water has been contaminated by hydraulic fracking and horizontal drilling combination. And you may have seen the pictures of people who have uh, 
turned on their water faucets and can light it because there's so much methane coming out of them, or in their wells, they can't use their wells anymore. It's gone, and the oil companies have to come in and give them fresh water. Uh, well, when you look at a cross-section of uh, the Appalachian Basin, you know, it's, it's a much broader ba base, but you see, what do you see here? It's, it's, you see faults, don't you? That's what the Appalachian Basin's all about. It's about fracturing and faulting. Are we noticing a common theme here? And the point is, does it look more like the San Juan Basin, where you don't have any problems with the aquifer contamination, or the Albuquerque Basin? Okay, let's look at some of these other basins where they're, they're testing these, these, uh, these uh, heavily um, organic-rich shales. For example, the Michigan Basin. The Michigan Basin doesn't have any problem with water contamination. What does it look like? How about the Williston Basin up in North Dakota where the Bakken is? Lot, thousands and thousands of wells being drilled up here. We don't hear any problems with contamination of drinking water aquifers. No major problems. Why? Well, the reason is, is because it looks more like the San Juan Basin and you don't have the risk, okay? You don't have the risk of contaminating the aquifer. But if you, do, if you look at a cross section here with all these, all these uh, faults and fractures, you have a tremendous risk. The other thing is when you look at where this is all going on in the country, uh, New Mexico, where fracking is going on generally, New Mexico is one of the states where it's happening at the shallowest levels. And the rule of thumb is the more shallow the well, the greater the risk of groundwater contamination. Just makes sense, right? Some say this ordinance allows fracking. That's not true. Our ordinance does not even have one word in it about it, fracking. This is a technological thing that the industry uses to recover oil and gas from the subsurface. Our ordinance does not deal with that. That came from the chairman of the Sandoval County Commission. My response, well, because this proposed ordinance does not prevent fracking, it does, in fact, allow horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracking. Okay, so, so here's, here's, take a look at this. This is where this is happening. And um, this is, the oil and gas industry is behind this right now, and it's all about money. And it's one of the reasons that barriers and Grand Staircase Escalante are being shrunk because they want to drill the shale well underneath it, and it's the same thing in Chaco Canyon. It's all about money. And my point is, hey, this is about water, especially here. And, you know, even, you know, if you talk to kids, they, they, they drew up posters on water. What, is, what does this mean? Water is life. And kids understand this. Why don't the energy companies understand that? My, my whole point about this is if you want to win this issue, and I believe we can win this, is we just kind of elevate it to a drinking water issue because it really is. I'll, uh, I'll take any questions if anybody wants to make any comments or answer any, ask any questions. Other than that, I'm pretty, pretty done. Absolutely, that's why I'm here. I've told Alicia and everybody that's listening that I'm more than willing to come and make, make a talk about this. This is such an important issue. And by the way, I don't get paid anything for this, okay? And I don't want anybody to think that I'm making any money on it. This is the right thing to do. And since I sit on both sides, I've been a scientist and I've also been uh, a mayor, I know how you have to present things for people to understand them. So yes, the answer is yes. Yes, sir. It's the same geologic condition, only it's deeper. Because you, as, you, as you go south, the whole basin gets, gets deeper and deeper. And, but the real reason to be concerned about this is if this is allowed in the shallow areas like Sandoval County, what flows downhill, right? Um, that's a big reason to be concerned. And uh, I believe that they started in Sandoval County because they think it'll be easier 
not as sophisticated. Uh, I think that uh, it's shallower. They'll be able to test it, test the waters, you know. It's more expensive to drill deeper in, uh, in the Albuquerque area and probably get a lot more resistance. But yeah, I mean, I, I if something major happens up in uh, Sandoval County and that water aquifer is contaminated, it's going to flow right downhill. And I'm telling you, there's no way to clean that up. That's why it has to stop now before it happens, before it starts. Yes, sir. So in that particular diagram, we drew the circles of where the uh, potential risk is associated with the uh, water and the, yeah, no, no, the resources touching each other. There you go. So in that diagram up on top, that is a, a natural occurrence. I mean, that is not man-made. There's no thrust energy. There's no company behind that particular fact situation. No. That, that, that is a fact situation. That, that is taken directly from New Mexico State geologists who right. map these areas. Right. And this is their interpretation of cross sections through that particular area. This has nothing to do with their own gas business. Right. It's done by the state. Correct. So the, the risk is there, regardless of any thrust energy or any other company. We there the risk is in this particular basin because of its particular uh, geology with all the um, um, you know the, the the shale and the, the crevices. That it, it's a very dangerous situation naturally. Yes. And the advent of hydraulic fracturing can only make it more risky. Right. And let's not forget that it's, that each of these formations is fractured to beat the band, right? And and including the magma shaft, right? So there's what 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 would anybody do, or what could anybody do to prevent a natural occurrence? Because what happens in the San Juan Basin, where you have the largest methane cloud in the, on the planet, that's natural occurrence. That has been going on as geologists would understand. That's been going on since the beginning of time. What man has done is there's very little flaring um, of uh, methane because it actually is a valued commodity by the oil and gas sector. There's very little uh, flaring that goes on in the um, San Juan Basin. There's a lot of flaring that goes on in the Wilson Basin. But in the San Juan Basin, there's very little flaring. So I wouldn't dispute, or I don't think anybody else could dispute, um, the fact that um, there's this natural occurrence of methane in water in the San Juan Basin. You actually could light water in the San Juan Basin. <laughs> But that's naturally occurring, and that might, might, might be naturally occurring here. What would you suggest that people living in and around the Albuquerque Basin could do to prevent the natural occurrence? I mean, forget the rest of energy and any oil company. I mean, nobody should get near that, I, that I don't, tinder box. I don't know of any natural occurrences where that's happening in the Albuquerque Basin, but then I haven't really studied the literature. Yeah. But I would suspect that there's not much of it, if any, yeah. because it's so fractured up and it's a lake fracture system. The, most people will stay away from drilling in the Albuquerque Basin horizontally because there's just no way it accumulated and all escaped, or you know, it's just not there. I well, an exploration geologist would say, no, we, we can't find anything in here. But you may very, very well, excuse me, may very well be able to find it in the magma shale horizontally when you fracture it, because the shale is so such tight rock that it entraps the hydrocarbons and could have couldn't have gotten out later. That's what thrust energy is going for. Yeah. So not as a geologist, but as an oil and, and gas company, a former oil and gas uh, company executive, why would any company go here <coughs> as opposed to going down the Permian Basin, where it's shallow, it's easy, there's a lot more room. Um, people are leaving the, the San Juan Basin to head down the Permian Basin. Why would anybody in the right mind even want to pursue the Albuquerque Basin with the complexity of the geology, with the um, you know, the, the environmental pushback, the, the density of the, the cities and whatnot. I mean, it's, it's just a, a foolish move to make from a business standpoint. Why do you think a company would want to come into the Albuquerque Basin? Very risky. Well, uh, I, I can tell you with, I think, quite a bit of authority that most big companies wouldn't touch it. 
because they've got too much overhead, they're looking for bigger things, you know. But who, who, who is talking about drilling down here? Small company, doesn't have a geologist on staff. Land company, it's a small company, it's about money. It's a land acquisition thing and it's about leverage. Yeah, so they might just flip it. That's, what I, think, that's what I think is yeah. going on, but I don't know that for sure, so take it for what it's worth. And Roger, I'll just point out, those are the operators yeah. who usually cause the biggest problems. Understood, yeah. Because they don't follow the rules. Right. <laughs> they just don't. Yeah. Then they go bankrupt. Yeah. Right, right. and it's right. a mess for yeah. the rest of us to pick up. Right. Representative yeah. Thank you, and, and I appreciate your, your presentation. I think hearing it and seeing it the second time around is much more helpful than the first time. I've learned a whole lot more. Uh, I appreciate you and your persuasiveness and your position on how you presented this. Now, last legislative session, I presented a couple memorials to help protect Chaco Canyon. And as soon as I did, I had oil and gas companies knocking on my door every single day, all day long, with their own set of facts, with their own set of presentation, trying to persuade me otherwise. Knowing that there's two sides to every coin, obviously you, you feel that, that you're right. And, and, it, and it's easy enough in this room because we're all on the same team. But what are oil and gas people going to say about your presentation that may persuade people otherwise? I don't know. I haven't heard that yet. But one of the reasons I tried to present the way I did was so it really is irrefutable by a, a, a geologist that has integrity. And, and, I, and I'm telling you that the oil and gas industry across this country now is one reason I'm out of it is that they're not telling people the truth. And it's all about money. And they can, they can sell you all kinds of things. And I really admire you bringing this up because it takes a lot of courage to stand up to them and to find out what it is that they're telling you that's not true. Because all those quotes that I had on there came out of the mouths of the commissioners and the oil and gas people. You know what? The commissioners don't know. They're not geologists. They were told that. And so they're repeating it. And they were told things that weren't true. So, and, and that goes to my point is that back then, I was very ignorant to the situation and to the issues. I was, I was very much impressionable on what people told me. So obviously, two sides of every coin. I knew where my heart lay, and that was with protecting certain things and, and, and areas. But you know, hearing them, I just want to make sure that I'd rather know their arguments to help combat them when the time comes, as opposed to not knowing and then be caught off guard. In regards to argument. That's, that's right. And you know, the only reason that, that I picked this up is because I've had years of experience in this. I could just hear what was coming out of their mouths and say that they weren't telling the truth, they're trying to mislead people. But that's because of my experience. So if I'm in your position or a representative's position or a council member's, which I used to be, I didn't know certain things. You know, I want to get experts in to tell me, all right, this is what the oil and gas people are telling me. What's the truth? Is that true or not? And, and get somebody that's unbiased. 